Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Good Grief. My name is Dr. Christine Malone, and in this podcast, we talk about trauma, tragedy, and survival. In each episode, I will interview someone that has gone through grief in some way, and we will discuss the impact it has had on their life. By sharing these stories, we hope that others won't feel alone should they be going through similar situations. Enjoy. Okay, listeners, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. My guest today is Celeste Mergens. She is an author, speaker, and founder of the global award-winning nonprofit Days for Girls and uh, the author of the book, The Power of Days. So Celeste, I know you've been through some trauma and I know you are going to talk to us about uh, tra- DNA trauma and so on, and then how you are you know, working with the community and what you're doing now that helps others. So go ahead and tell us a bit about you know, what you do, why you do it, and what what you get out of it. Thank you. Well, first of all, I think if you show up for the things in your life that really draw you in, that you, those things that you have to say yes to, um, your whole life changes and it becomes like a wind that lifts you instead of a rock that you're pulling along, right? Mm -hmm. So as far as days for girls, that that started from one of those moments where you just couldn't deny it. So we can come back to that. If you're interested, in, let me talk because it's amazing and and helps people all over the world. Days for Girls has reached more than 3.2 million women and girls in 145 countries on six continents. That's impressive. What's interesting about that journey is I didn't, if you would have bet money, you probably would have bet that I wouldn't even live to survive to the age where it was founded. Uh, I was 47 because of the, some of the things that I had been through. And and I learned along a way to your question um, that we really do hold trauma in our DNA and in our amazing bodies. And what's really cool about that to me is that it's it's as if our body holds for us what we need to process until we're ready to process it, at least for me in my experience. I was about 33 when I recalled a moment of something that happened to me when I was seven. Now, when throughout my life, if anyone ever brought up the person who had attacked me, I would become uncharacteristically angry and defensive. And I would be, um, it was like a gray haze came over me. I just feel like, you know, let's, no, 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 no. We're not talking about them. So when this came up, I was with a counselor and I had had this just dreadful for lack of a better word, angst following a nightmare that I had. It made no sense how I felt like people were asking if I had cancer because I was walking around pale for days. So I went in and and up came this memory and of being attacked at age seven. And as I recalled it, I, of course, was crying. I was, it, it was difficult. And, and what was amazing to me is that on my body afterwards, when I looked in the mirror, I had swelling in my upper lip as if my my face had just been pressed. I had kind of red speckled bruising along my left arm and upper left chest as if it had just happened. Mm -hmm. And what was fascinating to me, Christine, I wasn't hitting myself while I you know, recall this. I wasn't holding my mouth down while I recalled this, but my body looked like it had just happened. And I, it kind of amazed me. And so then I started researching, what is this? And learned that there are, there's a lot of evidence and proof and research about our body holding on to memories in our DNA and even epigenetic epigenetic memory. So um, that which has passed on for generations. Now, we actually know this. We're all familiar with this. We're familiar with the studies where animals know something the other generation did. The penguins, penguins, pigeons in a park know exactly where to go um, because their parents went there or what to avoid, right? So, So we know this is part of what our amazing bodies can do, but it's not something we talk about. Yeah. And and that moment set me on a path of really trying to understand and learn. I really have along the way learned some really important tools for how I 
started overcoming some of the trauma in my life. Would you would you like to go over some of that? Sure. Okay. So one of the things that I first started implementing was just stopping. And here's what I mean. Sometimes you're going along and you have a you have a feeling all of a sudden that you didn't have three seconds ago or 15 seconds ago. You're all of a sudden feeling down or bad about yourself. And you didn't feel that way a few seconds ago. And you're not sure what happened that changed it. But our most of us, our automatic response is, you know, move on, nothing to see here. Come on, ship her up. And we don't stop to say, yeah, but where did that just come from? Right. Because we want to move on from the negative, right? Bury it. It's in the past. And come on, snap out of it. And my learning was that if you stop long enough to say, actually, where did that come from? Hold on, hold on. Let me just be still for a moment. Ah, I overheard those people shouting. Or I didn't get that right. And the little tape in my brain started saying, see, see, you're stupid, or you're not competent, or what fill in blank here. Yeah. This little tape that I have in me that could be epigenetics, could be an experience I had, could be my own labels I put on. But regardless, that little tape hit in and that's what I'm feeling right now. And then if you pause just long enough, you can go, ah, deep breath. Well, I'm curious to know exactly where that came from. But here's what I do know. I am safe. I am here. I am loved. And I'm actually pretty intelligent. That's what I know for sure. So it's okay if I take a misstep sometime. Everybody does. What I do yeah. know is I will learn from it. So by reframing whatever you want to say afterwards, take ownership of what you want this to mean to you going forward so that that can rewrite. Now, can something that simple make a difference? Oh, yeah. And and here's why I've learned you have, as you so well know, the lizard brain part of our brain, the amygdala, that yep. emergency responder defaults to negative. That's its job to mm -hmm. keep us safe, right? right? Right. So all the experiences we have, first responder is default to negative. So we're taking back the moments, the energy, the tape, when we pause long enough to rewrite the narrative that isn't from a place of first response that yeah. isn't from a place of negative bias, we can start rewriting and reclaim our energy. You know, this reminds me, and I'm going to mess up the acronyms. I can't remember, but the therapy technique where you, you go back and you find the negative and then, you know, kind of work through what that was and why it's affected you. I want to say ELP or some EHP, something, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. ELP. Um, I have a friend that's really, really good at that. I Well, if you want to know how I really ramped this up, it was because a paint can fell over. <laughs> I was in my dining room. I just decided I needed to paint it. Um, I had just like two hours. It's a small space. And I I got to the very end, set, set the paint at the bottom rung of the step ladder. It fell over, spilled all over my feet or antique rug the uh, carpet oh. uh, well just the rug and the floor and I was like okay I I literally took a deep breath and said there are two choices right now go full lizard brain meltdown or stay creative and I literally you know tried to hold the moment open so I wouldn't go into lizard meltdown because I was well on my way and then, because I had a meeting soon and my feet were covered, how was I going to get out of this? And then, and then decided, okay, creative. And the most creative ingenuity, I, you should have, I ended up grabbing baking soda and a zip tie, pouring baking soda on the rug into the cracks of the wood floor, real wood floor. And, and 15 minutes later, there was no spill whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And, and that would not have happened if I went into meltdown. Yep. Understanding that made me realize, well, then what about the things that have happened in the past? And I call this mind the gap because there is a tiny moment between something happening to us and when we respond to it. And in that tiny moment, as we just discussed, first responder is, you know, negative bias. And you didn't choose that. That was your wonderful safety function. And so what if we open that moment back up and say, actually, 
I am going to choose a new decision. Even though it happened when you were younger, I'm I'm going to look at it. And and I actually do that with three decisions. Do you want to hear what they are? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> the first is pick up new details. So something I can recall specifically, more specifically about the event. And what this does is set your mind so that you're not thinking of it from your frontal lobe. You're not, you're not like trying to consider and puzzle over it because often trauma moments, we have done that a lot, all from that same point of woundedness. So instead be more present in it in a new way. And then the second thing is gratitude. And when you bring gratitude to the moment, now it's like the occurrence was a rock on top of you, a weight, if you will. And now gratitude allows you to come out from under it and go, actually, I've got a piece of this thing, right? So I think gratitude is powerful. My license plate on my car is G-R-A-T-A-2-D, gratitude, because I think it's so important for happiness and wellness and joy and connection. So gratitude. And then the third thing is to bring the wisdom of now. So, and by that, I mean, you know a lot more than you knew even 15 seconds ago, right? So, so you can bring the wisdom of now to a moment. So if I may, I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, no, you're the one telling the story. I just, I'm just here to okay. talk you along and I hear the story. So if I may, there is a, there is an example of something that happened to me when I was in middle school, that time when you could be uniquely mortified. It's a perfect word for that age, at least for me. And, and I had just come out of the bathroom and people were snickering in the hall and I'm looking to see what's funny. And, and then the girl behind me says, your skirt is tucked into your tights. And I'm like, Hoo! You know, I scurry back into the bathroom, hide there till the bell rings, make sure everybody's gone and then go out so mortified. But going back to that moment, if you take a deep breath, open it up, I actually do like Tai Chi, pull your hands apart, open it up and then go, hmm, the hmm helps because that also shifts from that trauma place to a curious place and breathing. So, hmm, and then I try to pick up more details. So I can recall, we recall usually really well a trauma experience, right? Yeah. Um, the tile was pink subway tile going into the bathroom, the, the square checkered floor, linoleum floor, the lockers behind the two boys here, and then a girl behind me. And, and then let's go to gratitude. So what can be, I'd be grateful for. It was not a fun moment. And I could be grateful for this girl told me, or I could have walked around like that all day. So thank you, girls, whose face I can't exactly <laughs> recall fully. And certainly not your name. Thank you for doing that. And then and then wisdom of now, what can I bring? So for me, the wisdom of now would be, well, actually, if it were now, I would yank it out, pat my bum and go, oh, my goodness. Can you believe that just happened? That was so embarrassing. It is funny, isn't it? Oh, thank you so much for telling me. I might have walked around like that all day and oh, I'll be off to class now. Hey, good to see you. See you later. Yeah, my guess would be having had that experience that, you know, you probably would have done this anyway, but but even more so if you were to see that happen today, right? You'd be the one to go up to her and say, you got this piece of toilet paper hanging out of your shirt, you know, whatever, that sort of thing. Yeah. I that rather than stand there and snicker, just be the person to help and, and remember what that felt like for you. Exactly. And, and that that's a piece of wisdom you gained from the experience, right? right? Right. So that would be gratitude. Look, look what I gained and, and look what I've learned from here then to now. And instead of what we can focus on the lack of the gap, mm -hmm. all that is filled, that's good in this gap and bringing this wisdom to appreciate who we are now, or even who we can be, how else could I manage that, that then you can close that moment and you have all the energy back. You have like, you have released yourself from that moment. That mm -hmm. moment is now yours and you've changed the interpretation. Now I'm not meaning the moment changed. You're going to see it in a new way. You're going to 
you're going to, that didn't happen. Now I'm not saying that as you probably all know, it's really more that understanding that you can interpret it in a new way and that you would respond in a new way and you get your energy back. Now, for the moment when I was seven, I can't pretend it didn't happen. I can't say that was a little thing. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't want to diminish it. Mm -hmm. What I can bring is gratitude that I survived. Yeah. And also that I, the heart in me survived, not just my body, that I didn't get crushed by that. And even that my DNA held it long enough so that I could take it on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and be confident enough and safe enough in my environment that I could process this. And then the other piece to just bring, you know, I just want you to know seven-year-old self that I'm so proud of you Yeah, that you did survive. And seven-year-old self, I want you to know there will come a day when you are safe and loved and that the very passion you have that you gained from that moment to help others stay stay, stay safe will drive you and eventually change millions of lives. You are, it's important that you survive and you did. And I'm just so proud of you. Hang yeah. in there. I'm with you. That's so, so, so powerful. I'm, 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 as you're talking and thinking of a couple of mortifying events in my own life and and how I've, I've actually one in particular that I haven't thought of in years that just came to mind um, and how embarrassed I was of it and and so on and just kind of think now I'm going to spend some time <laughs> and think about that and it be grateful and I've got to think I said to be grateful for it and that one but like and just kind of you know yeah have the gratitude and then the the wisdom that I have from that now and um uh, yeah, that's very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Tell us about your um, the power of days. So tell us what, what that is and, and kind of how that came to be. Oh, thank you. Well, The Power of Days is the book that I wrote. It's a memoir about some of my experiences and what I learned to shift through them with strength. And, and the founding of the global nonprofit Days for Girls and how that came to pass. Days for Girls is a global movement for menstrual equity. Now talk about things we don't want to talk about. People would rather talk about almost anything than menstruation. But when I learned how important it is and the cost people are paying all over this world, there was no turning back. I was, it was 2008. I had been helping an orphanage as part of my work in Kenya every six months, helping do education and helping a friend's foundation do community sustainable solutions for a com- very rural community. After being re- introduced to the orphanage, we were doing what we could help when we came through town. And then in 2008, there was a post-election violence that displaced half a million people. So this orphanage went from a way too crowded 420 kids to have reported 14 hundred kids mm-hmm. and they needed everything in the process of trying to help as best we could with other friends we there came a night that they called and said they've been out of food for two days well I know what it's like to go without food for days as a child and how it hurts and I wanted nothing more than to help them right now but we had sent everything we'd had we'd had fundraisers we were coming in just Three and a half weeks, I had nothing left to send. And and we we just were, I, I just pled for some kind of genius solution. Nothing came to me. And then woke with it going through my mind, have you asked what they're doing for feminine hygiene? I literally gasped, ran to the computer to ask and got an immediate answer. Back then we didn't have smartphones everywhere, so I didn't expect an immediate answer. And the answer was just nothing. They wait in their rooms. Mm. They were waiting on pieces of cardboard Mm. for days, not being able to go to class, not being able to take care of themselves. And and I knew we needed to change that. And I'm happy to say we were able to raise funds for food and for other things they needed and disposable single-use pads. But because I had experienced poverty as a child, I knew what it was like to not have what you need and have to choose. And so I knew if we sent money for 
had and they needed food, they would rightly use it for food. Right. What I didn't know is that's a case all over the world. If if a woman that just had to go to another job interview has to choose between fuel in her gas tank and a pad, right? And families have to choose. So how do you create a solution that could count a month after month? And we made the first design of a Days for Girls pad. And I asked them, who teaches them what a period is? And they said, no one, you can terrifying thought at the time I wasn't a world expert in this yet and and we came and we had this incredible conversation about how important their wellness is and that actually without periods there would be no people their body was doing a miraculous thing and here's how it works and and we had this beautiful conversation together five of us sharing and 250 girls were coming through another 250 coming. That's how many girls needed this. Mm -hmm. And, and it was miraculous how getting 500 kids put together could happen in just three and a half weeks. And, and the people that rallied, it was just so beautiful. We get there, we're sharing with them. They come to get their days for girls, washable kits. There are cheers echoing off the tin roof. And the first girls walk up and, and say, Thank you so much, because before you came, we had to let them use us if we wanted to leave the room and go to class. I'm hoping that doesn't mean what I feared it meant, but it turned out they confirmed later that they were being sexually abused in exchange for a single disposable pad. Oh, God. Oh. And that was the moment Days for Girls was born. Wow. Wow. That's yeah, that's one of those things where you you wouldn't have again. I, your your comment about how if you send money, they're gonna you know buy buy food. That makes perfect sense. Um, but this is a, a need as well. I mean, these these girls. It's just I mean that yeah, it's very moving. I appreciate you sharing that, and I appreciate you doing it. It's, that's that's awesome. So, I know you have not only do you have your books, but you have a website. Is that right? Where some people could go and learn more about you, or mm -hmm. well, you do. Okay, perfect. Well, we will link to that in the podcast notes so that people can find you, read about you, work you're doing, the books, and so on. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to share before we end today? One thing. Days for Girls, as you look into it and see how we bring people together from all over the world, it really is proof of what we can do when we come together over not our differences, but our shared desires for the world. And I think right now we're looking at so much siloing. But mm -hmm. the truth is, when we look for the things that connect us, the things we can be grateful for, yeah. the things we really want in the world, instead of the things we fear, the things that divide us, the things we don't want to happen in the world, amazing things happen. Yeah. I mean, I could never sew 3.2 million pad sets and, and reach global impact alone. But because people were willing to come up fearlessly and say, oh, oh, I care about that too. Something people don't even want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal things have happened. And, mm -hmm. and it's proof and hope for the things that you care about, the things that are heavy on your heart. Mm -hmm. They too can shift. And it really is a combination of one person can make a difference times That's thousands cool. coming together, each bringing their strengths and their, and that we, we really do need each other and we become stronger and our impact becomes stronger when we link together from that place of what would you love in the world? Days yeah. for girls and my life and the book, the power of days are all proof that those things you'd love to have happen, the desires of your heart are not only possible, but it's important because the healing brings the places you are meant to stand, which will invite others to stand. Yeah, It's an important, you are an important part of a global tapestry. And all of this is proof. Beautiful. Celeste, it has been a pleasure to chat with you today and to hear your story and all the good work you're doing. And again, I thank you for all that you're doing. I think that obviously you're, you're, you've, you've changed the world in many ways and that's um, always super powerful, I know. So thank you. Lovely to be with you.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Good Grief. To hear more about my personal story, please pick up a copy of my book, The Day I Became the Spider Killer, a memoir of trauma, tragedy, and survival, available in paperback, Kindle, and Audible via Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online book retailers.